Hi, everybody. This is Kathy L. Murphy reporting from the Robert M. Muntz Library on the campus of the University of Texas in Tyler, Texas. And I'm here tonight with uh, one of my favorite authors, actually two, because we have Jenny Sacken here, but our featured author tonight is Pamela Bennings Ewan, and she is a delight. And this book that I picked, I had picked her before. Uh, for a book. And actually, I've got you down for this year, coming year too, with a, right. a new book, Emily. But I, you had sent me, this is a backlisted book. Yes. And here's my philosophy on books. Publishers think that the only reason to promote a book is if it's brand new. And I'm of the opinion, if nobody knows about it, it's brand new to somebody, right? So she sent me the, uh, uh, this new book, and I don't, you have it right behind you, The Moon in the Mango Tree. Right. I didn't bring it with me. I love the fact that my lipstick and your clothing and the books all tie together, because, <laughs> you know, I have this art theme, you know, going but uh, we've all tied in together, but you have such a wonderful story. Um, first of all, your family literary connection, but be to begin with, you had another whole life story before you became an actual writer of all these wonderful books that are coming out. And I want you to tell all those who haven't read your books or don't know who you are, your backstory on your uh, profession in life, because it's fascinating to me. All right. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell them the ugly and the good. <laughs> uh, when, I, when I graduated from high school, um, I uh, went to college and flunked out the first year. And the, 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 the dean said, you know, Pam, you're just not college material. So oh I said, so, yeah, I know, I know. It's Okay. But I deserved it. I really did because I played around and just had a ball and just didn't do, I, I didn't do anything right. So I deserved it. But that was the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis, by the way. That's a long time ago. But so um, I played around for about seven years and then I got married and I had a child and I thought, okay, now I have to do something. I have to, I, I knew the husband I was with was not going to take care of us. So I knew I had to take care of my child. And I decided I was going to go to, I, I was going to become a lawyer. I didn't know any math. I couldn't do math. So I couldn't do anything like that. I thought, well, I can be a lawyer. Exactly. <laughs> so I went to, um, I, I went through law school and I became a lawyer. I, I practiced law with a wonderful international law firm, Baker and Botts in Houston, Texas. For about 25 years, I practiced law. And one day I wrote a little book. And it got on some bestseller lists and it was, really did well. And I had a lot of fun with it. I thought, this is really great. And we have a lot of um, artistic people in our family, including writers. And so I thought, I'm going to do this too. It's got to be in my genes. So it I is in your DNA. I swear <laughs> it is. You've got to tell this story. It's, it's amazing. Well, so, um, so I... Um, decided to go to law school and uh, I was able to get a scholarship because I was very poor. So I was able to get a scholarship and I had my son at the time. He was about three years old. I have to tell you this. I commuted from Corpus Christi to Houston at that time to go to law school. That's about 200 miles. And I would take my son with me in the summer and every, he was about four years old and I would put him in the car and he'd, I'd say, Scott, you want to go get a Coke? And he'd say, yeah. And we'd hit the, the city limits and he'd set, look at me and say, Mom, are we going to Houston? <laughs> and so he would go to all my classes with me. Um, he, he went to law school with me in the summertime. So I graduated from law school and uh, got a job, first, first job with a small firm in Corpus Christi. And then I went to Gulf Oil Corporation for a couple of years. And that was really fun. I have to say that in-house practice of law is really fun. But from there, I went to Baker and Botts, and I stayed with Baker and Botts for 20 years, uh, doing finance of all things. Can you believe that? I never, I couldn't pass any math courses. I never took, I only took one. I started algebra in high school, and the teachers asked me if I would please quit the class because I was confusing people with my questions. 
So, oh my gosh, we are so much alike because they, <laughs> they said the same thing to me. Oh, yeah, this I is know. So fun. Yeah. But you I can live it. without math. I found that out. And actually, I also found that finances isn't math, it was logic. So, I love practicing law. And I think I'm one of the few people that love practicing law, but I really love practicing law. And I had uh, so much fun with that. But when I wrote this little book and it did well, I really enjoyed it. I thought, this is what I'm going to do. And that's how I started writing. And this book, this uh, Moon in the Mango Tree is about 15 years old, but it's the story of my grandmother's life in the 1920s. And I'll tell you what made me write this story. I was invited to Yale Law School to give a talk. And so I gave the talk and afterwards, the, the, some of the women asked me if I'd like to come to a woman's meeting. It was all women and they were just going to be discussing women's issues. So I said, love to. So I went. Now, at Baker Botts and in any large law firm in those days, you worked long hours. I mean, I had many nights when we didn't sleep at all, but long, long hours and a lot. It was very competitive. So I get to this meeting. And I'm thinking, OK, I'm going to hear about all these people that really want to go for it and really make it in the legal world. And it wasn't that. It was all about I'd like to be able to find a place where I could come home at five o'clock. I want to have children, all this stuff. And I thought, whoa, this is wonderful. I just I thought that was just these these women were were really focused on other things they love the practice of law but they didn't want that to take up their whole all their time and all their days so from that um i started thinking when i was writing writing i thought women today including myself really have no idea how hard it was my with me it was back in the 60s and 70s um, with young women today, it'll be maybe two, you know, two, two years ago. I don't know, but these women back that that started it all, that gave us what we have today—the freedom of choice, the right to vote. Remember, in nineteen up to 1926, if you married a man, he owned everything you had. All of that went away, and how did it get pushed away? And that's why I wrote the Moon in the Mango Tree. Let me excuse my, let me just get a little sip of water here. It's fun. The I other love thing the story about, so much because my grandmother, grandmother grew up in the 20s and 30s and 40s, and she was a real spitfire. But my mother was Miss Domestication, typical 1950s. Oh, yes, exactly the Thank same. Girl. Exactly the Thank same. My grandmother was just really a spitfire. And she wanted to, she, and when she was young, she was beautiful and she wanted to be a singer. And she was trying to sing grand opera. She married my grandfather. This is in about 1918. And he, my grandfather went off to World War I. And when he came back, he said, you know, Barbara, I don't want to be a society doctor. I saw too much horror in, in this war. I want to really be able to help people. And the Ford Foundation had given him a, a, what, a grant to go to Siam, which is now Thailand. And he said, that's what I want to do. Well, my grandmother was horrified. She was horrified. The whole time he was gone, she'd been preparing for to sing grand opera on the stage. And she had an opportunity to do that. And she went to my great grandmother and she said, mommy, what do I do? I, I want to sing. I, why can't Harvey practice law here and I'll sing. I mean, not law, but medicine. Why doesn't he practice medicine here? And she said, oh, Barbara, grow up. This is your husband's career. You follow your husband. Yeah. So that mm -hmm. is the starting point of everything that leads up to today where women really are equal. We can do anything we want. I, I know that there are some things that happen and we can deal with those things. When I was a lawyer, I remember one day uh, my clients wanted to go out with some people and I and, and they needed their lawyer. So they invited me to come along and they had forgotten I was a woman. <laughs> and so 
they well, here we go to this men's club in Houston <laughs> and they didn't know what to do with me. You know, they didn't know what to do. So we all had to sit and wait while they there was a little a, a little small room that people were having a meeting in. They moved all of those men out of that room and put them in another place. So we could go in there so that no one would see the girl. <laughs> that And that's the way it was. Another funny thing that happened, this was with the Houston club in Houston. And that was an all male club. And one day they decided they were going to let women come in. And so they, they, they called me up and they called up various women one at a time. And they took us through, they, first of all, through the, through the restroom, which I thought was hilarious, but it was was beautiful with lots of mirrors and stuff. But that was the first thing they prayed in me through the restroom. We ended up out in the gym. We turned the corner of the gym, and there's a spa, a sauna, and half of my clients were sitting nude in that sauna. <laughs> nude, because they'd forgotten to tell them, and it was a men's club. It was hilarious. Oh, I know. Gosh. So that's, you know, you go from one thing to one thing where women have everything to the other, which is in the middle, which is kind of what I described, to my grandmother, where where it was the beginning. And I thought women, young women today need to know what, how, how they got where they are and how lucky we are. It's, it's so true. And so what an important book to read, because, you know, I always loved uh, books like by Beryl Markham, who was one of the first women to fly her own plane in Africa. Yeah, oh, yes, and, and yes. Ida Johnson. I know, read all these, out of, all these out women. Out of yes. And then Karen, uh, you know, Blixen and all these people, they always were inspiring to me. But then there came the next generation who became you know, the housewives, you know, yeah. and they, you know, bridge club and, and, mm -hmm. you know, they like the help, you know, it was like that. And I was, I don't know, I was somewhere, I didn't know, I had my grandmother who I love, and then I had my mother who I love, but I didn't fit either one of those because it's seventies, you know, seventies. Yeah, exactly. And, and I told my mother, she said, well, you know, when you get through, you're going to college. And I go, I really don't think I want to go yet. I go, I think what I want to do is become an airline stewardess so I can see the world and kind of figure some things out. She goes, no way, no way, because that is just not a, um, um, a profession that a woman would want to do. And, you know, I'd seen all these Pan Am women, glam, I know, they look all over the world. And I, and, the one day, I thought, do that. and Ann Hood, who came last year, wrote a whole book about it because she did that. And then, you know, went from modeling to become an airline uh, hostess. Now she's a New York Times bestselling author. I just thought if I had only done that first, I think my first experience at college would have been great. But I was kind of like you. Yeah. It wasn't because I was a big partier. It was because I was overwhelmed by you know, the size of the university. My first class I went into had 600 people. 600. A, bio yeah. a biology 101 class. And I was like, I didn't know how to deal with that, you know? Uh -huh. And I, uh, so I did, I did two years and then I dropped out and I um, told my mother I was going to beauty school. Oh no, you don't want to do that because uh -huh. all hairdressers are really as prostitutes. <laughs> and I was like, they didn't think so because this is when Farrah Fawcett and the yeah. Dorothy Hamill books had come out, and hairdressers had become cosmetologists and fashion yeah. icons. And so I took my mother to the school, and, and the owner, Mrs. Crum, whose son was a Redken, you know big stylist uh -huh. it was a redkin school she outdid my mother on snobbery she uh you know she convinced my mother that this was the most prestigious school in the country and she let me go and it was the best thing i ever did because it gave me my life's profession and helped me get yeah. through school because i never took out one loan to go to college so it took me 43 years but i graduated on my own seven universities so you know i i tell the kids in the classes your parents pay for all this and you just, you know, you're blowing it off. You, what you realize is everything you put into it 
is the kind of life you're going to have. If you don't. Yes. And we're, I, another thing, though, is when you're older, I think you soak it in a little bit more. I, I was so I was so stupid when I was young. And when I was old, <laughs> seven years later, when I went, you know, started everything over again, I just soaked it in. I just loved it. I studied so hard. Mm -hmm. I, I live here. They offered me a pillow and a blanket. That's how much I mean. <laughs> well, tell people, I, where, tell people where you are. It's in Tyler, Texas. It's yeah. one of the many University of Texas systems, and it, they're just now starting a, uh, uh, a medical school here at the University of Texas. They've got a pharmacology school, a nursing school, and now they're starting a full medical school. It is exploded and it is the most beautiful campus ever. And it's just 30 minutes from my house. Yeah, that's a wonderful so, school. Yeah, I love it. I love everybody here is so kind and and it's it's so diverse. I mean, every color, every country. Um, and it's it's just very these kids inspire me. And they I you know I feel like I've become kind of their little pet you know here, here comes and they go well how old are you and I go I'm 67 they go oh my god no way and I go well it's because I've always been around kids and my whole life with yeah. scouts and everything and youth groups and uh, I feel like if you keep educating yourself you stay young and uh, I encourage everybody to go back to school it's the best thing um, I've ever done so um, I'm having fun I'm really having that's a good time. Wonderful. That's just wonderful. But I'm excited about your books because we've got The Moon in the Mango Tree, which is an incredible story. Oh, and, you, you know, it may be 15 years old, but how old is To Kill a Mockingbird? Isn't it over 50? And it's considered one of mm -hmm. the best loved and read book in the United States. And now you've got Emily coming out. Am I pr pronouncing that correctly? Um, I, call, I pronounce it Emilia. And no, a million. Well, that's probably the more French yeah. pronunciation. You know, uh, she so, was a very, she and Coco were very, very good friends. Coco and Chanel. I, we've had several authors. I've always loved Coco Chanel. And uh, we've had several authors write about different aspects of her life, her sister's perspective. And, I, I you know, it, and she was from that era mm -hmm. of the, of my grandmother. You know, they were, they right, were right. Girls were very ahead of their time. You know, they really yes, were. The yes, Josephine yes. Bakers. Yeah, so this is going to be a great read coming up on our list. And uh, you want to give a little tease about that book, too, while we're talking about it? Well, sure. Uh, my grandmother ended up having to follow her husband and become a missionary's wife. And she just was so far from being a missionary's wife that it was unbelievable. So they ended up in Siam, which is now Thailand. My grandfather said, don't worry, Barbara. We'll be in uh, Bangkok. It's a very sophisticated city. People from all over the world come to Bangkok. They got to Bangkok and they were told that they had been uh, sent. They were being sent to the jungle city of Nan. It was the, <laughs> in the deepest part of the jungle. So it took them about five days to get from Bangkok to Nam because she had to ride a pony. She didn't know how to ride. That night they slept up on um, those high, you know, the high beds that they they'd create a bamboo bed and, and it was way up high so the tigers couldn't get them. And it ended up in the jungle city of Siam, which is called Nan, which had 40 temples and almost nothing more. So that's where she was. And she was there for four years. And she had amazing experiences, uh, mm -hmm. really funny because, because she, you know, she was not of a mind to, to, to play along with anybody. She was in there, all these missionaries were expecting the missionary's wife and she wasn't that. And then they ended up in uh, Bangkok and my grandfather became a uh, physician to the, to the royal family and the king. And that, she enjoyed for a couple of years. Uh, one funny little story was there in Bangkok, in Siam in those days, the white elephants were considered all belonged to the king and they were considered sacred. And no one was allowed to ever touch a white elephant except the king and 
the doctors that took care of the elephants. So one day, uh, my grandfather said to my grandmother, Barbara, I have to lance a boil on one of the white elephants. And so you're going to have to stand up on this balcony and you're going to hold out a banana. And when the elephant reaches for the banana, I'm going to run underneath and I'm going to slice off this boil and run out the other side of the elephant. And she said, what? <laughs> so she stands, she stands on the balcony and she does her job. And of course, the elephant just roars. You could hear it all over, uh, all over Siam, practically, she said. And she comes down and there, all these people had gathered to watch. And the king had about probably 40 wives. And so you can imagine how many children he had. One of his little girls, a princess, came up to my grandmother and she said, here. And my grandmother took something and put it, she put it in her hand and she said, it's a tail from the elephant. She had, she had somehow gotten a piece of a tail from the, one of the sacred white elephants and gave it to my grandmother. So I have it. Now, you know, I'm meant to bring it in no here. No way. I have it, yes. And it's and my grandfather had it wound around a stone. I don't know. It's a it's a good stone, but I don't know what it is. It's just beautiful. It's wound around a stone, and she wore that that bracelet all her life. But oh there was a point where she went back to what she wanted to do, which was singing. And it was a it was a poignant moment because she had to choose between two things she loved, singing or staying with my grandfather. So I don't think I better tell the rest of it or it'll ruin nope. the story for people. Or he's gonna have to read but, the book. But that's what it's about. A woman who had to choose between two things she loved, opposite ends of the poles. And it's it's always it's well that the best books have the most trying conflicts. Haven't you ever noticed they, you know, I just read The Covenant of Water by Abraham Verghese. Oh my gosh. You know, it's such a beautiful book. It's a tome. It's like over 600 pages, but it's one of the best books I've ever read. But every book that I pick, I, this year is just going to be outstanding. In fact, Janae's um, has three books and I, Missed her because she had another thing. So I just put them all on the bonus list. I put every one of them because you can't read one without reading the other ones. So I feel about my authors. If I read a story that engages me, I want to know the backstory. I want to know what else they've written. I want to see the progression of them as a writer in their story of their life. It's a journey. You know, it's an investment. And I feel like you invest in things that are, you know, really worthy. So it's important to me that, you know, people go, oh, you've picked this author before. And I go, well, why wouldn't I? They're writing the best stories. And um, and then I also spend a lot of time looking for newbies. And I found them. But I found you. And you have a literary legacy because you, you run in some pretty big circles as far as um, a writer uh, you know, people would die to be in your place. And, 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 you know, I've had so many of my book club members beg me to get one of your relatives here. And of course he's now of age and I don't think he's traveling at all anymore, but tell everybody right. about the backstory about your family. Well, it is interesting. Um, we have an awful lot of writers in our family. Of course, some of them are very well known. James Lee Burke is one. He's, uh, our family is the Burke family from New Iberia. And so he was about my, he's about my father's age. Um, and then Andre Debuse, who wrote The House of Sand and Fog, is another. Can you um, believe this? I know. Latisse Stewart um, writes, writes memoirs for four people. Um, and she's president of some organization, a national organization for people that want to write their life stories. So we've got an awful lot, we've got an awful lot of authors in our in our family. And also the odd thing is that's the writers are all on one side of my family. You're gonna like this. The other side of my family are artists. So it's just <gasps> it, my son is is a really wonderful artist. 
Uh, my uncle was a wonderful artist with heads three or four people that were really, really good artists in our family. So it's odd. It's kind of strange. But um, it's wonderful. It's just wonderful. And James Lee Burke's daughter is an author. So, you know, and I, is he your first, first cousin? He is a second cousin to me, first cousin to my father. That's right. I, okay. my, gra my grandmother had about 10 kids and then they all mm -hmm. had about seven kids, you know, so it's one of those <laughs> things. But one day, um, Catherine DeBuse was uh, sitting with me. We were we were listening to somebody getting ready to give a talk, a, a book talk. And we were talking about how many cousins we have in Louisiana. And this woman walks up to her and she says, hi, I don't know if you know me, but we're cousins. <laughs> and she, well, she was another cousin we never even met. So half of Louisiana is probably oh related to us. But I love big families. Yeah, just, just, yeah, it's it's my grandfather. My grandmother was the oldest of 12. And my grandfather on my mother's side, I think he had, I don't know, eight or nine siblings. Mm -hmm. But it just, and they, and they replicated themselves every 14, 15 years. I mean, generations were being repeated. Then they came to me. And I didn't even start my family until I was almost 34. So, oh, I, uh, you know, and so I slowed everything way down and I only have one grandson. He's four. four oh, how, oh, what a great age. And, what a wonderful uh, um, Oh, he just was with me Thanksgiving and we, we he is going to be my little travel buddy. I'm going to be Auntie Mame, and he's going to be my little Patrick. We're going to go to India, in fact. But oh, um, that's going to be we, we plan on having many adventures. That's going to be wonderful. So you, that's a great idea. So do you have grandchildren? Do you have grandchildren yet? I have one granddaughter. She's at LSU. She's a second year at LSU. Her name is Lucia. She's so beautiful. She's so sweet. Lucia. Just a wonderful. Ooh. Right. I lost a grandson. My grandson, oh, my dear sweet, dear wonderful sweet. grandson. But you know, that's a that's a our biggest fear in life is to you know lose someone we love that much. It is. It really yeah. is. But um, so Emmeline is out now, and um, are you working on another book? I am. Uh, the first book, uh, it's a trio. It's three books. Uh, the first book, as you remember, oh, is Queen, Queen of Paris about Coco Chanel, mm -hmm. uh, which is really startling mm -hmm. information in there that I don't think people yes. generally know about Coco Chanel. The second book is Emilian right here. And that's, uh, she was a very good friend of Coco's, but she's a little older. So in this book, she, it goes back to uh, the 19. About 1910, something like that, and she's mm -hmm. a courtesan. She became from from being a, 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 an impoverished child with no family. She became star of the Follies Brigere in Paris, mm -hmm. so and exciting. I'm working on the next one now. And what I can say about it, this will be the third one and the last one. But what I can say about it is so. I think it's such an interesting concept to me. After World War I, and right in that period between World War I and World War II, was so peaceful. Things were so peaceful. And people began to take that for granted. And nobody really, <laughs> nobody ever conceived that there would be another World War. So in 1939, mm. Winston Churchill, who just fascinates me, was, was mm. uh, he understood what was happening in the world, and he understood that we were on the brink of another world war. And he tried to communicate that, and everyone just brushed it off. The, so this group of people that were all together on the Riviera in world, in, right, right before World War II, um, my dog just came in here, and the television sets in the back. Can you hear that? <laughs> No. My little dog walked in and walked out again. But um, it, so right before World War II, an interesting thing happened. All these very wealthy people had villas on, on the Riviera. And it was like they were in a dream world. And 
Churchill and all these people, smart yeah. people, kept saying, this is, Germany is rearming. This is what's happening. Prepare yourself. And they totally ignored it. And so it was a summer of dreams. It was just a summer of people living in this dream world with everything about to explode. And we know it and they didn't know it. And it just fascinates me. So I'm I'm hoping that, that that'll make a good story. I'm working on that. I'm sure it will. It sure. Have you seen All the Light You Cannot See? That was a book I read that um, just I went... Can't directly to New York Times and they made it into a film. Oh, it was so good. I guess I'm going to have to read it. I I couldn't read it. I just can't read stuff like that because it's so sad. It's just so sad. What do you think? Is it that sad? I think if you watch the film, you'll want to read it because it was done so well. I thought it was done so well. But um, What a title. You know, it's always... It's a great title. Yeah, it's really, yeah, it's. Yeah, I have avoided that book. Go ahead. I avoided it too. But then when I saw the film, I I had it. I thought, okay, now it's time to read it. Uh, You know, sometimes when books get a lot of hype, I just back off because I go, they got their push and everything. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, if somebody keeps it up and keeps it up, I got, I go back and I go, well, that was silly of me. I should have read it, you know, but uh, it turns out I really get a good. Book. Oh yes. I, I really get a big kick out of when I discover a book that nobody really knows about and oh, then it becomes famous. I don't know. It's, it's just like a, you know, it's just, I've had it happen with so many authors like Jamie Ford and Lisa Wingate. And, you know, I watch them go to film and um, oh, I just like finished wonderful. the Marsh, the Marsh daughter, uh, the, the Marsh daughters. Oh gosh. Why can't I think of it? And it's gone to film. I mean, that's the fastest yeah, right. book I've ever seen go to film. And um, yeah, I, I really enjoy it. Did you mm-hmm. read where the crawdads sing? Where, where oh the yes, and I saw the film too. And that that I know why it was so um, popular and everything because it was I was shocked. You know, most stories can't shock me anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm finding that the more books I read from other countries. Their their ways of storytelling are absolutely fascinate me. I you know I got into all these Bollywood films, and Pan Asian films, and I am absolutely don't see it coming. I can read American novels and I can see it coming a mile away. You know, I oh, like really? to read things yeah. where I don't. You know, Where's some people awesome? love to read mysteries because they like to solve it, but. taken by people. Yeah. Huh. Wonder well, you just never know. The world has changed. No? Janine? You lost Janine. Huh. I'm here. It shows that we're on. Okay. Yeah, well, we're can on, you hear me on. okay? Let, yeah, let me close my door because a dog opened it and the birds it birds screeching now. Hold on one second. <laughs> okay, no problem. I'm going to try to see if the internet went out. Okay, let me see. Uh, why is it not? Working? My little bird is so loud. She goes into Amazon rants. She's a little okay. A little can you hear me now? 
Yes, I can hear you. Okay, I don't know what happened, but I think I kind of clicked off for a minute. I, It's been going out in and out here at the library, which always concerns me because I've got my biggest book festival in the world coming up. But I think if we just hang together, mm -hmm. um, I'm going to do some research over the holiday and see what happens. But um, I'm very excited um, uh, for you and to have another book coming out. Do we, you know when that last one will be released? Probably, or? probably next, around probably. next November, probably. Okay. So, a year. Well, that'll be great. I'm almost finished. Okay, well, you got to it takes them about a year yeah. to get it all together. I'm amazed at how fast you can write because I, I'm i not like most authors. My last book, the full book I wrote came out in 2008 and it's now 2024. And I'm not in any hurry to finish it because the pu publishing world is um, turned kind of upside down. I, I'm hoping it'll come out for my 25th anniversary. That's what I'm hoping now because um, um you know, it's, I mean, it's still, it's the Pulp and Queen goes back to school. I'm not done. So yeah, I, right, you know, right. I wanted to have that ending. So we'll see what happens. You have a, you lot, know, yeah, I have a lot on your plate right now too. Well, I like to have a lot on my plate. It keeps, you know, the, the more you, if you stop, you drop. And the more you go, you keep on going. It's like the Energizer Bunny. So uh, I like to be, uh, engaged at all times so i i just work on that um i don't know i've just always worked multiple jobs my whole life so it's really hard for me to yeah um, I mean, relax. The same. We're, not, we're a lot alike because i it's i had to do the same thing i'd have two or three jobs at a time i used to now, write when's your birthday when's your birthday my birthday is march 22nd okay. In March. March 22nd. Well, we're not this. I thought maybe we're the same sign. I'm a Virgo, but uh, no, I just think it just happens. And I, I, I do think that people are brought into your path for reasons. And I am so thrilled that you and your husband got to come this last year to Amelia Island. That oh, was so, so much fun. fun. That was the best. Time. I hope we can that do it next year, maybe. Best. Maybe we can go back. I'm hoping so. I, you know, I was going to have, well, I was going to um, uh, have them get enough people signed up to, you know, usually by the first couple of months, I have uh, over 100 people coming. And I didn't have but 15 May 1st coming that weren't authors. So I yeah, said, you know, I can't have all these authors come and not have an audience. So I said, I'm going to have to let that deposit go. And um, I'm going to have to do it Zoom again this year. But actually, I've done two of them. And I've learned more about the authors during the Zoom conference than the actual conference, because I'm so busy running around trying to make sure everything's yeah. going smoothly. I don't always get to hear all the authors. So this way, I always get to hear them. So it's going to be a lot of fun and we're going to be, I'll be working on the program uh, starting December 1st. So you two will know and everybody who's watching this when I post it on um, the Pulp of Queen channel, I'm going to be announcing the winners of the uh, books of the year. And so I've been telling everybody vote, 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 because you don't know your vote could be a tiebreaker. So um, if you have not voted, and you're a member, you need to just send me an email for the book of the year, the international book of the year, and the bonus book. And they're all listed on the website. Just, you know, you don't even have to write the full name. Just say, my book, you know, and the other two. <laughs> and, um, but I've been telling them, and I'm going to announce the winners so that those authors can get the stamp and the, and the holiday gift sales. Right. And then I'm going to announce, go ahead and announce the 2024 ahead of time because I want people to be reading them before the conference. And so I want them to be ordering them now, getting them read. And, um, and I'm asking all the authors as if somebody reads your book 
we send them a book plate. So, you know, if they send you a receipt, they bought your book, send it. but um, we want um, everybody to be reading our books because when I look back through the 24 years of books that I picked at Jeanette Walls, um, you know, Alice Hoffman, um, Barbara Kingsolver, I, I look at all these authors and I think, my gosh, nobody even knew a lot of these people before I oh, even I picked them. And I know Jamie Ford, nobody knew who he was. And now he's one of the biggest authors in the country. So Lisa Wingate too, but it just keeps going. And I, I'm thrilled because there is nothing more important to me than getting people's stories out there because the stories help build bridges between different cultures, different people, different languages. And um, now, um, the world is wide open. It's just like you said, um, hopefully some of these changes will be going into these countries where women aren't treated quite as nicely um, or respectfully as, you know, uh, we fought so hard to have right. happen here. Right. Um, I mean, we've got, still got a long way to go. I'm going to tell you, we've got a long way, but I do we feel do, like but the you know, basics are all there now. Staff. Right. And, uh, you know, vote. And people go, well, I vote for the president. I go, vote in the primaries, people. You need to vote. So um, uh, if you were uh, talking to a brand new author, somebody who was really uh, wanting to write a book, hasn't even begun, what would be the number one advice you would give to anybody who wants to write a book? What would that be? Read the classics. Read all the classics you can get underline remember what uh, you can learn to write from those writers i i, I have a, a thing that just hit me over the head once i was reading war and peace and uh in the whole the whole entire book it really didn't engage me that much but there was this one the writing was fabulous and there was this one scene in war and peace and the man is getting ready to enter a forest and he has his little dog with him and it's all from he he is the person he is he is the the person that's talking and he's saying we're going to go into this woods and we're going to do this and that and all of a sudden for the first time in the book the writer tolstoy jumped into the little dog's mind and he had the little dog say something like well i don't really understand what it is he wants me to do and for the first time <laughs> And that for the first time, that was, I saw how you could really break the rules. You could really change the, the perspective. You don't have to stick with it. You could jump into something and break the rules and come back again. And then that little dog never appeared again. It was just that one little moment. So you can learn things like that from great writers. And that's, yeah, I, it's more important than school or anything. I, you know, the more you read, the more it's power. It's power right. because you know what stories work. And I'm really excited about um, Jeffrey Lawrence Matthews is going to be my co-host because he wrote that um, One Must Tell the Bees, the story about if, you know, um, um, Abraham Lincoln had met, um, you know, uh, gosh, why am I going blank, had met the big... Um, uh, Gosh, why is it right not in front of me? Well, you'll have to look at the book. But he, they never did meet in real life, but he wrote a book about the possibility of it. And I go, it was an incredible story um, because, you know, it was just something so unexpected. Uh, you know, Pat Conroy, I could read a book of his and I'd hit a line and I just stopped dead in my yeah. tracks. Yeah. And I felt the same way about me. Pat Conroy. Yeah, it's beautiful. Oh. Uh, you know, and a lot of people goes, oh, he pontificates and he goes on. I go, that's exactly why I love him. But he can he can make a sentence speak volumes. And when that happens, you just have to sit back and just think about it for a while. That's right. And, and if, so you, if you read the great writers, the original classics, if you read that, you learn and then you can sh take shortcuts. 
and you can do yes. things that you've thought up. But but that's that's the those are the seeds that great. I I put up today on my pulp with Queen Pop, which is all about books. I put what was the one book that you read in college that stayed with you and that you never forgot. And I mean, I don't care what it is, you know, what is it? I, you know, and it's the variety of books that stay with people. For me, I remember I had an English professor goes, you haven't picked from the list of authors I gave you to write a research paper. And I go, nothing engages me. And she goes, come on, Jane Austen. I go, no, no, Jane Austen. I, everybody goes, you must love Jane Austen. I appreciate Jane Austen, but Jane Austen, it doesn't speak to me. And so she said, okay, I've had it. I'm going to give you this book. And she handed me a Larry McMurtry book called uh -huh. Cadillac Jack. And I fell in love with, I've read everything Larry McMurtry ever wrote in my Oh, it was so good. Yeah. Open my bookstore. You know, he had bought that town up around Wichita Falls and I emailed him and I said, Mr. Murtry, I, you know, I've known you forever. You're a fellow Texan. You know, it was a few days went by and I got a fax, fax from him. And he said, Kathy, it's love, Larry. And I, for my shop, I still have it. But I, I just thought his honesty was just, he wasn't, you know, trying to, he just told the truth. And that's all we ever want is just, you know, I, I read more truth in fiction no, then I do a non definitely, definitely, because you're free to say what you want to say. Yeah, definitely. Well, and also, you know, Pat's wife told me, she goes, well, you can write the story the way you want it to go. And I love that line, too, because. Yeah, yeah. But I've always, I've always written nonfiction, but I have been working on a novel and it'll probably be my swan song, but it will be, it will be. They may publish it after I die. That'll probably be the only way it'll ever sell. But um, I have a novel I've been working on most of my life, and it's it's I love it's I love it. But I'm oh, not ready to share it yet. You know, you're gonna hate to you're gonna hate to yeah. <laughs> you're enjoying well, it. Well, you know, I have I have a. I heard one of my favorite inspirational heroes is a Bollywood actor, Shah Rukh Khan. He's spoke all over the world. He's a philanthropist. He's interesting. He said, I, he was reading an excerpt from his book about his childhood. He lost both his parents very young and, you know, didn't grow up, you know, in opulent situation, but he had educated parents. But um, he said, I just don't want to finish it because I feel like if I do, my life will be over. And I go, I, I kind of get that because when you're writing that one tome i remember willie morris wrote a book called taps and it came out and he died and i just oh. and it was just like i was only 54 years old if you ever read taps i highly recommend uh that book uh, uh he was from yazoo city mississippi and uh, he was a brilliant man and everything he ever wrote, I, I adored. He's the, one of the only authors I adored that I never got to meet. But fortunately, I've gotten to meet most of them. And, um, and that's, that's always my goal is I always have somebody I want to meet. So I'm yeah. so happy I met you. Oh, and um, I'm really thrilled. Well, you it's going to be fun. It it's going to be, be fun because reading is, um, to me, the best entertainment in the world. I mean, you're getting educated, you're getting enlightened, and you're, but the sharing of the stories uh -huh. is yeah. what makes us human. It it's does. like going so, on a vacation. You're in another world. In another world. Jania, I want to bring you in the conversation. Um, you know, is there anything you want to ask Pamela about her books or share or... Um, you know, I think it's just as important that you showed up for the conversation as her. So uh, if you have a comment, I'd love to hear it. Um, I do have a question for you, Pamela, and that is um, the moon and the mango tree. 
focuses on the story of your grandmother. I'm assuming it's a novel. Yes. yes. Um, could you talk about how you fictionalized your grandmother's story into that novel? What you chose to include from her life? What you chose to perhaps change up? If there were things you felt you had to leave out um, to appease the family? That's a very good question, really. That's a very good question. Very good. I, did, I didn't leave much out because my grandmother was, um, uh, she wasn't going to let me hear anything that wasn't flattering. <laughs> she was like that. She was so funny. One day we were at the Sanger Theater in New Orleans and I was 12 years old. And the Sanger Theater is huge and it has balconies all around. And in those days, they would play the national anthem before the show. I was about 12 years old. Well, they started playing the national anthem and I was horrified because my grandmother stood up. She made me stand up with her. Nobody was standing up in this whole place. She, so she made me stand up with her and she sang the entire national anthem by herself in that place. And it was beautiful because she was a trained singer. And everyone in the Sanger stood up and cheered and clapped. That was the first indication I ever had that she sang and I was 12 years old. So she was, she, she kept a lot to herself, but I found, uh, first of all, I found all the, all the letters home. She was, she was a daddy's girl and she and her father wrote probably every day. I have stacks of letters from them. Um, I also knew her very well, and I knew all of the stories, you know, the, the kind of interesting little stories. I knew all of those because she had told me all about all of that. Um, so it, it was a really not difficult to write. The only difficult thing, Jeannie, is you're right. I had to leave things out that were not... Um, important to the story because it was the story is complicated and it's long and I wanted to make it easy I wanted it to be her story I didn't want to go off onto little rabbit trails so I, I didn't leave out anything that was important I didn't add it I didn't add much to it I, I I translated it into a story a novel um but but the whole thing was it was so much into me already. My grandmother told me so much of it already, and I have all these little things that she brought back from Siam that I just you know I told you about the white elephant hair. So it was really a part of me. It was really, and you know what my mother said after she read the book. My grandmother was a very um, unusual person, and she was a you know she would go off on her own own trail. And my mother said, after she read the book, you gave me my mother back. Because she had never understood, for example, why, my, why, why she spent two years in Europe in a, in a boarding school with, a, you know, with her mother just visiting. She never understood what happened. She never really knew. So it was, um, wow. it was not a hard, difficult book to write at all. I was just right there in it. I felt like I was in it. What a gift to your family. Well, for my certainly for my, my mother and her sister, they really, they cried, actually, at the end of the book. Mm -hmm. It really is. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, when the book came out again, uh, Blackstone oh. published it, and they sent me the manuscript, and they said, here, if there's anything you want to change. And I thought, I can't change. My mother and my Aunt June are up there, and if I change one word, they <laughs> they send lightning <laughs> down. <laughs> That's right. It's not one word. That is so such a great story. Thank I you love very it. much for saying that. Yeah, it was really good insight. I'm glad that you shared that with us. So, um, no, yeah. Anything else, Janine, you want to ask? Um, I do, and I'm afraid we may run over if I ask it. Um, I'm wondering for your trilogy, how could if you could talk a little bit about the research that yeah. um, oh, I love research. That I just love research. In to write 
this historical fiction? Um, I, I, with the trilogy, I, I, I was way down the line with the trilogy because I've written several books and I've done a lot of research. So I'll say first that it, when I wrote my first couple of books, I was in the library all the time. I would get, I'd have to talk the librarian into going to get microfish for me, you know, down in the basement where they hadn't looked in 25 years, that kind of thing. Oh. Newspapers, magazines. When I wrote The Queen of Paris, it was the most amazing thing. First of all, if you need facts, it's all on online. Anything you, I mean, if you, if, if you can't think of a word, you can say, Hey, Google, what's another word for slipping down in the sand you know, on a muddy day? That kind of thing. So that that is just a blessing. I, I can't, it's like night and day. But the, res, the research that I do is mostly reading. I read just about every book that I can find around a subject. Mm -hmm. You know, if there are autobiographies, if there are things other people wrote, if they had really good friends, I'd read about that, you know, that. I just I read and read and read everything around the story any possible thing and then online as you probably know you can get newspapers you can you can uh, subscribe to all the old newspapers archives so you can get a lot of information I was writing a book one time about where where part of it was set in Greenwich Village and of course it was maybe 80 years ago, and I wanted to know what Greenwich Village looked like at that time. So I called up, found out the fire department in Greenwich Village, and all fire departments keep maps forever of what the area they're in looks like. At any point in time, you can get a map from a fire department. Wow. So things like that, you know. You just, I, I would research to see what I had to research, that kind of thing. And of course, if you love to read, you can go off on a tangent with that too. And several of my books started from something that I read. I read an article in the paper. This is kind of, this might make people a little upset, but I'll say it anyway. There was an article in the newspaper about a little boy in Chicago on a roof. He was about seven years old and he was with two 12 year olds. And the tw one of the 12 years old was holding the little boy by his feet dangling over the side of the building and the other and he was the brother of the other little boy and the other little boy said to him no no let him go give him to me let him go and the other little boy said let him go and he released him well that was of course front page news that that was the story that was the beginning of a story uh, entire book so the res you know, research and reading, I, I, I say again, you can't do enough reading. Right. So true. So true. Thank you so Thank much you. for that. This Don't forget the fire department. It's fascinating. <laughs> Don't forget the fire department. Now, I will, uh, this will be downloaded. And uh, by tomorrow morning, I hope to have it back up so everybody can watch it on the Hopla Queen channel. You can oh, share, wow. share, share. And it's up there forever. So if you ever need somebody to see what you're like talking there, it's a great thing to share with everybody. And, you know, I'll send it to your page so you can, you know, all your people can watch it that didn't come to. Oh, mind. thank you so much. That's wonderful. That'll be fun. Yeah, yeah it'll fun. be fun. This has thank been a really wonderful conversation. Yeah. As always. And, and next week, we'll be back with another author. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Janine. And we will uh, talk to you soon. I'm going to be in classes till December 7th with finals. And then I'm full steam for the holidays and our annual You're breaking up again, but I just want to tell you, good luck on your final exams. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> Knock them dead. Yeah, yeah.